created an opportunity uh, actually basically hit a hole in one. They were able uh, to identify that there was water very early on in their mission. Um, they were designed to, to last for 90 days. And they in, actually ended up lasting for years and years. So over the course of their lifetime, they identified water, water in different forms in terms of things that were in lakes and rivers, water that uh, was very acidic as well as water that could have been more neutral. So it was a huge success. With that, we were able to find, really determine that there was, had been uh, water on Mars. The next mission uh, in the rover lineage is Mars uh, Sample Laboratory, which is the Curiosity rover in 2010. Um, this is Curiosity. It's about the size of a, a car, like a, a PT Cruiser or a mini Jeep. Um, and Curiosity was going to Gale Crater in order to find this water. Um, a few years after this, I think it was around 2015, uh, Curiosity was able to determine not just the evidence of past water on Mars, which is what Spirit and Opportunity were able to do, but evidence of current liquid water on Mars. And that's huge, right? Now, with the evidence of current liquid water, um, as well as Curiosity's uh, discoveries of the building blocks of life, the chemical composition, um, the chemical components of what um, life needs, like the carbons and the nitrogens, we had all of the pieces that uh, we thought were essential for life. We had the liquid running water of neutral pH. We had the building blocks of carbon and nitrogen. Now the next step was, can we actually find the signs of past life? And this is Perseverance's main goal. Now, in order to, to get there to, for Perseverance, uh, we had to do things a bit differently. Spirit and Opportunity were uh, small-ish rovers, right? The size of a, a kid's toy car. So our method of landing them on Mars was basically to cover them in bubble wrap and let them bounce around until they were slow enough. So uh, we came in as a ballistic mission, jettisoned the parachute, and then when we were close enough, we literally inflated these big bags, sort of like bubble wrap, all around the rover. Um, we lowered it on a bridle and then cut uh, cut the thread of this, this bubble wrap encased uh, rover bounced on the ground uh, over and over again until it eventually slowed down and it was to a halt. Um, and then it popped the balloons from the inside, lowered the panels and then drove off. When we tried to do this with curiosity, uh, it didn't work. The rover was way too big that every time the force of the, the bubble wrap encased rover landing on the ground when we were doing our testing uh, would rip these bubbles um, to shreds and poke holes, and then that would kind of negate the, the safety effect of the bubble wrap. So Curiosity designed a new uh, way of landing on Mars, which was the sky crane maneuver, where uh, we use retro rockets to hover above the ground and lower the rover wheels down um, onto the surface in order to uh, land there safely. Now, Curiosity could do that also because uh, Curiosity went to basically a parking lot next to the thing that it wanted to explore. So Gale Crater um, had a, a big um, ejecta in the middle called Mount Sharp. Uh, and then there was a big flat area in the center of the crater. And Curiosity basically found a big enough, flat enough, uh, rock free enough place in the center to land. And that's essentially like finding the smooth parking lot outside of the, um, you know, the actual area of interest or the hiker trail that you're needing to go to. That method didn't quite work for perseverance because the point of trying to find uh, evidence of past life, you actually need to go to where we think had the best chance of preserving that past life. So for perseverance, the scientists and engineers decided on Jezero Crater. Uh, this is a, um, a color warp map of Jezero Crater. The white circle here is Perseverance's landing area. And you can see that um, this area is, there are a lot of things going on in this area. So if you look from the top, uh, you can see this, um, this channel flowing down. This is where we think there was an actual like river channel flowing in to Jezero Crater. This is the uh, rim of Jezero Crater. And you can see this beautiful ejecta 
here of all these sediments coming in and flowing into the base of Jezero Crater. We think Jezero Crater may have been an ancient lake bed. So um, what you're looking here is kind of the differences in that tier of the lake. So you have the, the initial higher ground uh, river channel flowing into it, and then the, the shallower um, part of the river. And then you know how you get far enough in and it kind of drops off and you get a deeper lake bed? That would be this um, bottom portion over here of the the deepest, flattest portion of the bottom of the lake bed. Now, uh, these have a, bu a bunch of relief in it, and that's exactly what the scientists like, because you can land in one place and you can actually drive with perseverance to uh, many of these different regions, right? If you, if you land uh, in this region, you get this sample, you can go to uh, this wall, which is almost 800, um, uh, which is, this one I think is around 300 to 500, and then this one is more than 800. Um, meters apart. I have I did go back and look at my my figures, but there's several hundred meters difference between the base here and the top here. Uh, and then this is also there are enough um, channels that you perseverance could theoretically drive up here or maybe up into uh, this river channel itself. So the scientists were like, this is the best place to go. They originally considered it for curiosity, um, but it was deemed too hazardous because not only do you have a cliff here in the middle of the landing area. All of this region here is littered with rocks, big rocks of, of all different sizes that this river maybe uh, came and, and put at the bottom of this uh, ancient lake bed. So how do we actually land here uh, with perseverance in a place that we never thought um, we could go to before with curiosity? Perseverance and curiosity are um, very similar. Uh, they borrow heavily, perseverance borrows heavily from curiosity. So. She's about the same size, a little bit bigger than Curiosity, a little bit heavier, but more or less the same. So in order to figure out how to land Perseverance here, we had to develop new technology so that uh, she could land safely and wouldn't um, accidentally you know, land on the edge of, of this cliff and tumble down or land on a rock here and um, twist, her, twist her foot uh, and be able to land safely. Um, so I'll get into a little bit of the new technology uh, later in the mission. But just keep in mind that we're going to a much more hazardous site than Curiosity. Uh, and the purpose of going to Jezero Crater was really to find the best evidence of past life. Perseverance's mission um, is to find the signs of past life and to um, prepare for eventual human um, travel to Mars, uh, and most importantly, to bring back samples from, to, to collect the samples that can one day be brought back to Earth. In order to actually find the signs of past life and say definitively that there was life on Mars, um, that's a huge statement to make, right? Because that that is in and of itself an answer to the question of are we alone in the universe? And for us to be able to say that, you really need very strong, indisputable evidence. When we build these rovers, we can only send them with so many instruments, right? They have a limited set of uh, instruments that they can actually do measurements on. So it's only if we get the samples back and we can unleash the full arsenal of the scientific technology that we he have here on earth that we would really be able to definitively say that we found evidence of, of past life on Mars. That's why getting the samples back is so important. And you can't get them back until you're able to go there um, and find what those samples are. So Perseverance uh, has four main phases. Uh, launch, which is July of 2020. Uh, Perseverance is a type one uh, trajectory to Mars. And this means that it has the, the shortest um, trajectory that you can possibly do to get from Earth to Mars. They time it just right with the planets and do uh, basically a home and transfer. So the minimum time, it only took about six and a half months um, for Perseverance to get from Earth to Mars. Uh, so about, say about less than seven months to get to Mars from Earth, and then seven minutes of terror to get from the top of Martian atmosphere to the ground uh, safely, and that's called entry, descent, and landing. And then that's really just to get there and start doing the science. So the surface mission is aimed to be at least one and a half um, Mars years, which was about three uh, Earth years. So Perseverance landed in February 2021. So we're already past February of 2023. So we're 
uh, two years into the prime mission, which is about um, three years, but she's still going really strong and doing all sorts of, of great science. So just to give you some context of the Mars 2020 mission as a whole, it comes in a lot of different pieces. Uh, Perseverance is the, the main piece kind of at the heart of the rover. And you can see the wheels of Perseverance here all tucked up into the belly, kind of all folded in. Uh, and then here you can see that broken up. So around Perseverance, we have to add all of this hardware and all of this hardware that you see around Perseverance is solely to get uh, perseverance from Earth to Mars safely. So starting from um, the top here, this cylindrical part is what we call the crew stage that has the sensors and uh, actuators, the thrusters and little jets that help um, the mission navigate in interstellar space in the vacuum between Earth and Mars. Uh, so it attaches up here. That's what these are. These gold things are the propellant tanks that uh, actually hold the gas to get from uh, Earth to Mars. Um, once we get close to Mars, about 10 minutes before we're slated to hit the top of the atmosphere, uh, we jettison this. So this cylindrical part comes off uh, and it goes and crashes elsewhere on Mars. And then we're left with this capsule, um, which is comprised of the back shell here and the heat shield, which is this big gold thing at the bottom. Uh, so the, the heat shield, as this capsule, it's almost like uh, an airplane because we do guided entry. So we're maneuvering this capsule through the atmosphere of Mars um, at the beginning of the entry phase. Uh, this heat shield at the bottom uh, is what dissipates all that um, energy from coming in at ballistic speeds uh, interplan interplanetary uh, speeds into the atmosphere of Mars. So the heat shield is what protects the rover from all that heat. The back shell here, which is this cone, white cone at the top, you can see these little cutouts. Those are the thrusters that help us um, maneuver during entry in the Martian atmosphere. This also holds our parachute. So we jettison the parachute from the top of this cone here, uh, and that slows us down significantly. Once we're on the parachute, we jettison the heat shield. So the next thing that uh, gets rid of is this gold heat shield that gets jettisoned. It also goes and fly, falls somewhere uh, else on Mars. And now we're coming in on a parachute uh, with the rover tucked up underneath this. Uh, once we slow down um, and have figured out where we are, we then uh, cut the back shell. So we're coming in now with just the rover and it's uh, jet pack. This is called the descent stage. It's basically a set of huge rockets uh, and enough smarts in order to maneuver um, Perseverance right above where it wants to land safely. And then it lowers Perseverance onto a bridle, which is uh, part of this descent stage. Um, once Perseverance is, our, is wheels down on the ground, uh, the descent stage or the jetpack cuts the bridle and then it goes and flies off and crashes somewhere on Mars. So all these pieces eventually in that span of 17 minutes or so from the start of when crew, the crew stage jettisons, they all eventually like disperse to suffer. So the only thing that's left on the ground is Perseverance itself. Uh, that whole capsule is the Mars 2020 um, project. Uh, we deliver that to Kennedy Space Center. Um, and this is the integration into uh, the Atlas V launch vehicle fairing. This is just the top of it. So you can kind of see the scale here. Uh, this is the whole um, Mars 2020 mission. It's getting encapsulated in this launch vehicle. There are some cabinets down here. So you can kind of get the sense of like how big a person would be, which would be like about, you know, halfway up this cabinet um, compared to this huge launch vehicle. Once Perseverance goes into this launch vehicle, they button up this fairing and then they put the fairing on top of the actual um, engine or jets of the launch vehicle. And then they launch it. The, the fairing itself is the very top portion here. Uh, and the rest of it is, you know, the launch vehicle, the rocket itself and all the rocket uh, propellant and fuels and stuff. So this is a picture of the actual launch of Perseverance at the end of July in 2020. Uh, smack dab in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, we actually did manage to get um, get off the ground uh, within our primary launch window, which is great because as I mentioned, um, 
Perseverance was assuming that we were going to have the shortest journey time between Earth and Mars. And to do this, you have a very narrow window that you have to hit. So uh, there's about three to four weeks every um, 22 months where Earth and Mars are perfectly aligned that if you launch during those three weeks, you have the shortest uh, trip time around the solar system to get from Earth to Mars. Uh, so Earth and Mars were at their closest at the time of launch. Um, and by the time we arrived at Mars, we'd basically done like a half circle around uh, the solar system. And that is the, the most direct path for interplanetary speaks of getting from one place to the other. Um, we had up to six uh, opportunities to correct our trajectory to make sure that we were on course. Um, but Perseverance actually had really uh, a really good injection. So we used um, three of them and these are kind of uh, planned maneuvers. And then with the third one, we were coming in smack dab um, on, on course, right on course. So we actually didn't even need to do the, these last three maneuvers. We were, we were really well within our corridor at the, um, at the end of the, our third uh, trajectory correction maneuver. It's about 300 million miles that Perseverance um, travels during its roughly six and a half months to get from Earth to Mars. So just keep that in mind, 300 million miles. Um, and we're trying to uh, hit a very particular region on Mars of Jezero Crater, about uh, eight kilometers, uh, about eight by six kilometers on Mars. And then of that eight by six kilometers, which was roughly the size of that white circle, um, we have to find a, a safe spot and land to it. We had aimed for landing to it within 60 meters. Um, we actually did much better than that. And I'll, I'll show a little bit more about that. Uh, so this goes into just the the things that I said about uh, how entry, descent, and landing works um, when I was describing the hardware. So about 10 minutes before entry interface, uh, we jettison the crew stage that's up here. So that cylinder part comes off. Um, we have some oops, we have some masses uh, on the vehicle that kept it uh, stable and um, spinning like a top during cruise to keep it uh, gyroscopic gyroscopically stable. Uh, we actually get rid of those um, and we create um, an offset in our center of mass. And this is because we're actually gonna fly um, the entry capsule like a plane. So we create this offset. So we have a lift vector uh, and throughout um, entry, we actually do hypersonic aero maneuvering. So we're actually doing these bank turns with uh, Perseverance um, as an entry capsule. So we're flying it like a plane. Uh, and this is in order to, um, get closer to where we wanna be on the ground. So just like a plane, if they're coming in too steep before they hit the runway, they do these S curves to kind of, uh, they're still descending, but they're um, too, uh, too close to the runway. So these do the S curves to control their distance uh, to the runway. That's exactly what we were doing with, with Perseverance. So once we get past uh, peak heating and peak deceleration, which is about 10 Gs um, that Perseverance pulled here, uh, we, we deploy the parachute, uh, supersonic parachute over two meters in uh, diameter. Um, we upgraded uh, from Curiosity here. Curiosity used just a velocity uh, trigger to deploy its parachute where it basically sends, okay, if I'm going you know, this fast, I'm gonna deploy my chute. Um, Perseverance did a little better. It, it basically deployed the chute uh, depending on how far it was from its target. And that allowed us to um, get a 40% improvement on how well, how accurately we were landing on Mars. So that one line change of code uh, in the logic of when to deploy the parachute got us um, a big boost in terms of landing accuracy for, for Perseverance. Once we're going slow enough on the parachute, we deploy the heat shield. Uh, we have a lot of sensors um, that we use to do ground relative sensing to figure out uh, where we are with respect to the ground. The heat shield is like a lens cap, it's preventing us from seeing the ground. So we deploy the heat shield. Um, we don't need it anymore because the peak heating finished over here. Uh, and once that heat shield is gone, we use uh, both a radar and an imager uh, to look at the ground. The radar gives us distance from the ground, how far is our range. Uh, and then the imager helps us localize where 
perseverance is. So we take images as we're descending, and um, this was the new technology that we added called terrain relative navigation, where we actually take images and then compare them to a map that we preloaded on board. Uh, and we that comparison of taking the image and looking at the map and seeing where they fit allows us to localize and say, okay, we are here on, uh, on Mars right now. And by knowing where we are, we have another preloaded map that um, has basically colored the whole landing site, you know, in different shades of between red and green of what's safe, what we think is safe to land on, and what we what we don't think is safe to land on. So based on uh, where Perseverance figures out where it is, it automatically decides which landing spot to target um, based on where it is and how far it thinks it can go. So once it figures that out, um, it picks its safe target and then. We've gone slow enough on the parachute that it's not going to slow us down anymore. So uh, it's not useful anymore. So we uh, jettison the parachute and then come down on our jetpack. As we do the maneuver to get out from underneath the parachute, um, we use it to go fly to our desired safe spot uh, and then lower the rover on the bridles. Once the rover hits uh, the ground, then we um, cut the bridles and then fly away. And all of this on this map uh, takes. 17 minutes, it's pretty slow at the top, and then everything from here all the way to the ground takes seven minutes. So now I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna do a little glimpse of how it was uh, on landing day. Propulsion, go, EDL phase lead, go. We have deemed Perseverance ready to execute entry, descent, and landing on her own. Confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second, about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. It will start controlling its path to the landing target. Parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. The heat shield has been separated. Perseverance now has radar lock on the ground. The back shell has separated. Skycam maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. Tango Delta, nominal. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. I love that video every time I see it. Um, and it, it's not, the imagery itself of landing was fun, but the best part to me is that these images, these are the actual images that Perseverance took. And we were the first ones to actually be able to see landing in this way. Previous missions, you know, we get, we get the data back, we get the ones and zeros, but uh, we don't actually have that visual. For the first time we had put enough cameras on the whole rover in all sorts of directions that we can actually capture this footage live to see what the parachute looks like, to see what the descent stage uh, looks like actually on Mars, not just uh, intuit what it looks like based on the ones and zeros that come back. So that's that's kind of why I love uh, watching that video to see how it all came together and how it looked that day from, from Mars. Um, so just a little bit on the technical stuff, if any of you guys are curious, uh, this is what I mentioned. It was a one line change of code to decide when to deploy the parachute. Um, the blue here is what Curiosity's uh, landing ellipse looked like. Um, and then the yellow is 
the effect that we got with changing that one line in, in software of how to deploy the parachute. So we actually were able to improve the accuracy about 40% from this long oval to, to this almost circle just by that one line change in code, which was uh, amazing for us. It, you know, a lot of bang for very little bucks. Um, and then uh, terrain relative navigation. So this was the big technology that we added for Perseverance in order to land at Jezero Crater. And what terrain relative navigation does, it basically uses a special computer that has fast enough image processing uh, with a camera that is looking down during descent to take descent imagery, uh, stitch them together using an IMU, compare that imagery to a map, uh, localize features on the map and use that to come up with an estimate of where we are with respect to this map. We then take uh, a similar map where we've identified uh, all the hazardous areas. So on this one, red is bad, you know, blue is, is good. Uh, and you can see this white circle, this black, what is black circle on here is the same white circle that I showed you on the, on the previous slide of of Jezero Crater. So you can see it's it's not an easy peasy uh, place to land. All of these red zones are quite pervasive in this landing area. And we're trying to find the blue, you know, the blue little dot. Um, so this white line is where Perseverance came in on the day of landing. Uh, and the dot here is where it actually landed. So you can see we we were hoping that it would land, you know, somewhere in here. That's kind of where we put the center of the lips. Well, we, uh, in the entry phase, we we shot a little long. So we were in this kind of sea of rocks and it did what it was supposed to. It found the the little blue spot amongst the sea of red in this area. So uh, after it picked that spot and flew to it, it landed within five meters of uh, where it had uh, chosen to go. So after the 300 million mile journey, uh, we ended up landing pretty much five meters from uh, where we had aimed to go, which I think is absolutely incredible. Um, this is a little bit more detail on how it works. There's kind of a two phase uh, process where first we do a, a gross uh, landmark matching. Where we kind of look at uh, three images in bulk and process them. And then once we have a, a good you know, understanding of where we are, and then we take more images and kind of refine that uh, to better, um, better accuracy. And we had to work around a, a wide variety of um, operation, you know, constraints of when we were going to land on Mars to make sure it worked under all those conditions. Um, this is how the correlation actually happens. So we, this is the image as we take it from uh, the descent camera. And then this is that same area cropped on the map and then normalized. So the algorithm picks features here and then uh, cuts out little squares of those features um, and then normalizes them. Uh, and then compares this normalizes here by like taking them across the map uh, and then finding where you get a peak where it actually matches the point on the map. So you get a peak for each of these uh, templates. And then by having those, you basically have a spot uh, and then knowing the orientation of those templates, you, you rotate and then you can say, oh, that must mean I am here exactly. Uh, so what this looks like when it actually, and then we repeat it again with um, many, many more features on the fine map to so get a better estimate. What this looks like on the day of landing. So this is the actual uh, um, data from the landing vision system uh, on the day of landing. Uh, the big green uh, squares are the, um, are the features that we use to track. Um, the descent image is here on the top. Uh, top right, and then the map is the one that's on the bottom right. So we're comparing these two. Uh, what's on the left here is the uh, blue cutout of where we are on the map, just zoomed in. Um, so you can kind of see here, we start with the big green squares, we get a lock, um, and then we go to the little ones. And as we descend, um, we're the this blue square is getting smaller and smaller, because as we get lower, we're seeing less of the original map because we're much lower to the ground and the camera field of view is only so much. So you can see it gets smaller and smaller. And then we do these uh, divert maneuvers to actually go to the landing site. So you see it skew off to the right because the camera uh, is only seeing a portion of the ground. It's looking in the air and it kind of comes back. Uh, we, we only expected it to work um, on the parachute. So the fact that it worked all the way 
to the ground was incredible um, and is a huge uh, deal because that uh, same technology gets fused in for the next mission, which is a sample retrieval lander. Uh, green is good. These green squares, if it's green, that means it was good. We were able to use it for tracking. Uh, and the blue means um, basically it was good, but we had enough of what we needed. So we didn't need the blue. So the fact that we got a lot of green was also really good. It was a really good day to land on Mars. Um, and with that, I can conclude. Uh, I just want to say that Landing things on Mars, uh, launch and landing, it's an incredible team uh, effort. This is only part of uh, the massive team that helped bring Perseverance to Mars safely. Um, and I'm, you know, just one head down in there in the corner. Uh, and this is probably one of the last pictures we took just before EDL of the team. Uh, this is the landing team holding up our lucky peanuts um, that we have to eat before uh, every mission just to make sure that the mission goes safely. That's our JPL uh, tradition. And with that, I think I can close and open it up to any questions that people want to ask. Thank you very much. Um, well, I am going to take the the direct or the the speakers or the MCs prerogative and ask the first question. I just want to uh, make sure that you were talking about the seven minutes where it was falling and doing the mapping. Uh, that's autonomous, correct? That's, you know, the people at NASA or at JPL are not doing anything with uh, Percy. Percy is landing itself, essentially. Yeah, so about uh, everything about entry, descent, and landing is autonomous. About an hour before, uh, maybe an hour, hour and a half before entry uh, interface, we actually turn off the transmitter for uh, Perseverance. So that at that point, Perseverance cannot receive any more commands. Uh, so it's not just the seven minutes, it's actually um, more than an hour or so uh, before landing, everything is on its own. We've actually uh, coded it such that um, it, it can be like two to three days where it's just doing, uh, everything is autonomous and we're just monitoring uh, from the ground to make sure everything stays, uh, stays on track. Um, when we turn the transmitter off, that's when like our hands are off in mission control. We can't tell it what to do. We're solely monitoring. Everything that we see is actually delayed because it takes um, 11 minutes or so. For the day of landing, it took about 11 minutes for light to travel from Mars to Earth. So we were getting all the information, but it was delayed by 11 minutes. So when it actually happened on Mars, Perseverance was on the ground You know, when we heard it was a few minutes away from touching the top of the atmosphere. So over 500, thousand lines of code over like 30 pyrotechnic events that have to happen uh, in that span of you know 17 minutes and it, there were a lot of single point failures or so any one thing if the parachute didn't work it was game over you know if the the radar didn't work it was game over um, and we had to build all the autonomy for the the vehicle to figure out what was going wrong and to do enough protection that it could get to the ground safely. That just amazes, just amazes, uh, amazes me completely. So uh, do we have any questions for folks in the audience? For Dr. Mahan? Yeah. The question is, uh, what information about Mars has Percy discovered so far? That's a good question. Um, I have to admit, I am not a geologist or a scientist. I know Perseverance um, has made a lot of discoveries over the, the last two years. I have mostly been following for the samples that it's been collecting. So it um, actually collected uh, a set of samples and created a depot on Mars. Uh, and these samples range in different types. So like the, there was a sandy rock uh, and a core rock sample. And uh, that's the different science that I'm aware of. of they were able to to go to different regions of Jezero Crater and find um, different areas of habit habitability um, and have selected samples for them for eventual return uh, to, to Earth in the next mission. Yeah. How will the samples be returned to Earth? And so when? there's a <clears throat> new mission, uh, so it's a very complicated um, set of missions. Uh, the next one up um, to go get it is called Sample Retrieval Lander. Um, it's slated to launch in 2028. 
Uh, and it is a lander which carries um, two things. It carries a, a rocket, the Mars Ascent vehicle, um, and it carries two um, sample fetch helicopters. So sample retrieval lander will land. It, uh, either Perseverance will still be alive and it'll come up and drop the samples um, there or the helicopters will go grab the samples, pick them up and put them in um, into the, the orbiting sample which is this big canister that will go inside the Mars Ascent vehicle. The Mars Ascent vehicle will launch. The sample retrieval lander will like push it, like throw it up, and then it'll ignite. Mars Ascent vehicle will launch. First launch we've ever done off of another planet. Um, it will uh, deploy the orbital sample in orbit around Mars. A second mission called the called ER, uh, ERO. I forgot what the E stands for, but it's an ESA-based mission um, that will be in orbit around Mars, will capture uh, in orbit around Mars, will capture the orbital sample, and then it will leave Martian orbit and come back to Earth. It will have put it into um, a like an Earth entry vehicle, which is kind of the third piece of it, and deploy the Earth entry vehicle back to Earth, and then that will land in the Utah test range somewhere in the 2035s. There's a really oh. cool trailer. Uh, if I find it at the end of the video, I can, I can send the link out. That shows how those samples will eventually get back to Earth. Oh, so very easy, very, very <laughs> yeah. simple procedure. I, if perseverance was hard because there was one landing, uh, one launch and landing is always kind of a critical. We've serialized like those critical events. So you have to launch Perseverance, land Perseverance, launch sample retrieval helicopter or sample retrieval lander, land sample retrieval lander. So it's another seven minutes of terror. And then you have to launch the Mars Ascent vehicle. Uh, then you have to capture it in orbit. And then you have to do another landing on earth in order to, to get them back um, to the ground. Yeah, sounds easy. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So the question is, why weren't redundancies built into those single point failures? We built redundancies in where we could, uh, but there's only so much mass we can launch, right? And you saw for every pound that perseverance increases, you have to increase all the other things as well, right? The heat shield has to grow, the back shell has to grow, you need more propellant in the cruise stage to manage it. So it's a balance between how much redundancy do you build in, uh, without it ballooning such that now you no longer can launch it, right? Because launch vehicle costs are almost by kilogram of the entire thing, not just the rover. All right. Uh, folks online can ask questions through the chat if you, uh, if you would like. But do we have any other questions? And in... is there one question? Um, I can scroll. I don't see one. anyone all right well if we could have one more round of applause for dr mohan thank you that uh yeah uh, I, I think you all are just wizards over there um uh so what we're going to do now is we're going to transition over to our uh telescope or observatory tour ian is going to uh, Ian is going to handle that. So, Ian, if you want to pop in and right. uh, switch right. over, uh, Dr. Go. Mohan, you are welcome to uh, stick around or um, or take off as you as you would like. I'm going to take off. Thank you very much for for having me. I really thank you it. very much for being here. Thank you. Go ahead and start sharing my screen. Uh, can everybody confirm if they can or cannot see it, and if my audio is coming through all right? See, there's my mouse. All clear? Well, uh, my name is Ian Helm. I am a fourth year undergraduate tour guide here at the observatory, as well as in the lecture room right now, we have Aiden, another fourth year tour guide. Uh, 
I am part of Dr. Peter Plavchan's Exoplanet Research Group, and we use this very telescope to find planets outside of the solar system. Uh, first, in order to actually use the telescope, we have to make sure it is not cloudy, unlike what it is tonight, unfortunately. There I am. Uh, right now, we're looking at the live security camera feed with the outside of the dome on the roof in camera number three, the inside of the control room in camera number two, where I am, the telescope itself in both cameras one and four, with one focusing on a side profile and camera four being the main motor of the telescope. I can go ahead and pop over to the sky X. We can attempt to slew to somewhere we do not normally slew to, to see the bottom of the telescope. Let's try due east. So we use this program called the sky X to not only see what is up in the sky in real time, but also to control the telescope as you're seeing right now. If I remember correctly, this is how to point the telescope at the camera. Should be to the east and around the horizon. If anyone has any questions, please stop at any time. And it looks like we already have one. Uh, we have a message from Craig, yes. That is a good message. Now it should be coming right around almost there. Well, what we're seeing on the top right now is the second mirror of the telescope. The telescope uh, as a 32 inch Ritchie Cretion Cassegrain reflector, uh, a lot of words. The important thing to know is that the 32 inches refers to the diameter of the telescope. It is 32 inches across. The reflector means that there are mirrors in this telescope. And the Ritchie Cretion means that there are several of them arranged roughly in this pattern I can pull up in the stock photos folder. Tours and stock photo. Boink. It's very zoomed out. Let's zoom in. So if we take a look back at the camera feed, we'll notice that there are these, there's this thing on a strut and there's a flat-ish bottom. That is because uh, as a reflector telescope, it needs to reflect light to let it in, as opposed to a refractor telescope like a spyglass that uses lenses. The primary mirror, the one at the bottom, the first mirror that light hits, is the one that is 32 inches across and gives the telescope its name. It's slightly concave, meaning it bends light inwards and zooms in, uh, or bowl-shaped, have you. Then the secondary mirror is about a foot across in diameter and is convex or bubble-shaped. We can also move the second mirror up and down to focus the telescope and get a sharper image. Not pictured in this model uh, is the third mirror. On a regular Cassegrain, this is where you would put the eyepiece. But on ours, a Ritchie Cretion Cassegrain, we have a third flat mirror that would rotate in the axis of this image around like so to let us select our output ranging from the camera to the eyepiece to the new video camera and even an infrared camera. Let's go ahead and move the telescope around once more to the west so that we can see that. Uh, yes, I would like to slew to the east, to the west. Hmm. And turn off tracking for something that close to the western sky. We have one message. Almost enough to get off the phone and talk to me while he was eating them, but not that good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to keep Bill from going to the commissary. Any yeah. questions so far at this point? Yeah. You've had much to do about nothing. A lot of these programs are rather unique to our observatory. I think even the, the build of the SkyX is custom dev that we have. 
But one thing I like to use that can run on any PC or even your phone is Stellarium, which is a lot like the Sky X in the sense that it shows you what's up in the sky, but obviously minus the telescope control. It's perfect for amateur astronomy. So we very slowly watch the telescope move around. Let's check back in on it. Almost there. Here we can see the eyepiece coming in right here on the center with the video. No, this is the infrared camera. I apologize. Infrared camera here on the bottom and the video camera here on the behind. But the main bread and butter up here on the right is the CCD cha camera, charged coupled device. How this device works is that much like the cameras in your phone, it has a ton of little pixels. These pixels let in light that then turns into electricity that, as you can see by the, by the mess of cables, connects to our computer, and then we can turn those electrical signals into computer images. However, since these pixels right. are much, much more sensitive than the ones on your phone, they don't exactly care about the color of light that they're accepting. They only care about how much they get. So in order to colorize the image, which is important for photography, like what Owen did to make a pretty image that's not just in black and white, or for our research to tell what the temperature of a star is, we have to use the color of the star, thanks to the black body effect. There is a wheel of filters you might be able to see right here, the large flat disc oh. that has seven different options at the moment. Red, green, and blue. Ultraviolet, infrared, clear, and hydrogen alpha, the last of which is a dark red color, 656 nanometers in wavelength that corresponds to the primary emission line of hydrogen. So that one is useful for making false color images of nebulae. And then the uh, blinking box you can see right there is the adaptive optic system, AO system, one of the newer additions to the telescope. Thanks to a system of wiggling mirrors, this device detwinkles starlight in real time. And we already have our first few guests arriving. So I'm going to go ahead and show that is the folder on my computer. I'm going to show some of the more popular targets we have had for this time of year. Uh, this one is probably going to be really easy to tell what it is. Uh, no, it doesn't like me. I apologize. We have recently upgraded to Windows 11, and some programs, including Maxim DL Pro, do not like to work properly with the new operating system. Here we go. You might be able to tell uh, from the file name what this object is, but it's obviously the most recognizable object in the night sky, the full moon. Uh, although it's still in a waxing gibbous tonight, I think this weekend around the 5th, it will be full. So that's uh, definitely a good time for amateur astronomy for looking at the moon itself. Uh, unfortunately, on nights of full moons, you can look at the moon itself and not much else as it'll start to wash out everything in the sky around it. This particular image of the moon, although in black and white, so not colorized, although that doesn't particularly matter for the moon since it's already black and white. This image was taken in an ultraviolet filter meaning that it is reflected ultraviolet light off of the moon. We can tell it is so because of some of the data, but as well as the fact that these ray craters, including the Tycho crater down here, are much more prominent than normal with highlights around the areas of spread debris. This time of year, another popular target we like to show off. Let's go ahead and click and drag this bad boy here, or should I say bad girl for the morning star Venus. Uh, just like the moon, the planet Venus has phases, although there is almost no such thing as a full Venus as that would be when it goes behind the sun compared to us, and that would be a bit harder to see. So in a sense, the planet almost has reverse phases from the moon. Right here is the crescent Venus from about a year and a half ago. Just the brightness there a little bit. Crescent Venus from a year and a half ago. 
Uh, right about now, Venus should be in a gibbous phase, much like the moon. Uh, Venus, as you may or may not know, is not a particularly nice place to be, even though it looks very pretty in photographs and radar images from craft like Mariner or Venera. The planet itself is over 900 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, thanks to a combination of it being closer to the sun than Earth, but more importantly, due to a runaway greenhouse effect. Some of you may heard of the greenhouse effect on Earth causing the ice caps to melt. On Venus, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is so severe, literally the hypermajority of the atmosphere, that the effect compounds on itself until the surface is hot enough to melt lead. Uh, add on to that, the pressure of all that carbon dioxide is roughly the same as being half a mile underwater, or no, an entire mile underwater, and the fact that acid rains from the sky, and you'll get to see why most Soviet probes that landed there lasted only a few minutes before disintegrating. Right now we can see Aiden, one of our other, that's not Aiden, Aiden was there earlier, that's Jonathan right there, another one of our tour guides and presidents of the Friends of the Observatory Club. We have two different astronomy related clubs here on campus, Friends of the Observatory that do uh, talks like this for students and astrophotography sessions uh, headed by their president, Jonathan, right there, as well as the Physics and Astronomy Society, of which I have an, I'm an officer and our president is Jack Garby, who is not a tour guide here. We do uh, mostly trivia and physics related activities, but we do have monthly star parties and field trips to areas such as Sky Meadows State Park or the Air and Space Center in Udvar Hazy, our most recent event. Uh, we have more students coming in, so I'm gonna pop off a different type of object. Boop. Although, that, oh, that's the wrong screen. Oh no, what are you doing? What are you doing, Windows? Put it back here. Although it may be on its way out now that it is summertime, this is probably my favorite object to show off. The Great, ne the Great Nebula of Orion. This right here, the fuzzy bit on Orion's sword, if you can zoom in and, what's my mouse doing? Stop doing that. The fuzzy bit of Orion's sword, you may be able to see it with your naked eye in a dark area, including Sky Meadows State Park, but using a telescope with a long exposure time like we can, and then compounding the image, especially with the hydrogen alpha filter I mentioned earlier, we can get this rather spectacular view of this large pink region around a few stars. This pink region being the fuzzy bit you can see with our eyes, and this fuzz being a combination of hydrogen gas and dust. The nebula itself is what is known as an H2 region, H Roman numeral two, not to be confused with H number two, refers to ionized hydrogen gas versus H number two refers to molecular hydrogen gas. This gas is being ionized or electrically charged by very hot, very young stars in the middle of this nebula where stars are made, but using RGB, we can't exactly see through to the middle of this image. We're seeing too much of the glowing gas and not enough of the starlight. By switching around some of the filters and reprocessing, we can get an image of the nebula in higher wavelengths. Uh, you can also get this through using infrared as it pierces dust, but it wouldn't do very much to combat the glowing of the hydrogen. So this is done with a combination of blue and ultraviolet filters. Using these high energy wavelengths, we can see only high energy starlight from both the blue stars in this formation known as the trapezium, as well as the nearby Theta Orion down here, another hot young star. Now also in Orion is a very large and very red star known as Betelgeuse that may or may not have gone supernova by now. Uh, when a star does end up going supernova, they end up making a formation like, where are you? There are you. This, the Crab Nebula, one of the most famous 
supernova remnants. As the name implies, it is what is left over after a star goes supernova. Uh, thankfully, the sun will not do this, as it is far too small to explode and will instead just get really big and then get really small. But for stars much larger than the sun, here's our fellow tour guide, Nasir. Are you okay if I bring a picture? Yes. Okay. Uh, looks like the Crab Nebula will be our last object showcased uh, before our research. Leave it up. I see. Sorry, just confirming something with Nasir. Uh, the Crab Nebula is home to a neutron star, a very dense object formed when a very large star goes kablooey. Unlike the sun, which will stop fusing elements on the periodic table after carbon and oxygen, stars that are much, much bigger, like 10 or 20 or even 100 times bigger, can simply keep going down the periodic table, living or at least prolonging their life by a few million years. They go from carbon and oxygen to neon, sulfur, sodium, everything at least even numbered, all the way up to iron, element 26. Thanks to a large amount of physics, iron ends up being the most stable element in the universe, meaning that it takes more energy to put iron together than it puts out. The reason a star is a star in the first place is thanks to a balance of fusion pressure and gravity pressure. If the fusion no longer makes energy, the star will collapse under its own gravity, which is very bad because that throws everything in, which then will soon throw everything out and cause the star to explode. Very fun. Uh, this explosion for this particular nebula was in fact observed by both Chinese and Arabian astronomers in 1054, where they observed Yes, I'm currently using the telescope. Do you want to switch over? <laughs> yes, do you want me to park it back? No, that's fine. Well, when you're done. Obviously. Yes. Are you going to park it right now? Uh, let me finish up with them, please. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> uh, the star exploded in 1054 and was thus uh, labeled as a guest star, as a star that could even be seen during the daytime was visible for several weeks before it faded away. Uh, after that, astronomers of the time did not know where this object was, but using modern technology of both long exposure cameras, uh, thus seeing the hydrogen exterior of the nebula in the pink, and then some of the heavier elements, uh, including metals in the middle in this white region. Uh, but more importantly, through radio telescopes like the Green Bank National Radio Observatory, which both the Friends of the Observatory Club and the Physics and Astronomy Society take field trips to, we are able to see the dead center of the nebula, which has a pulsar, a special type of neutron star that pulses. As it spins around, it generates strong beams of magnetic fields, uh, thus appearing like a little lighthouse. Does anybody have any questions at this point before I talk a little bit about the research and then wrap everything up here? All right. Well, the research we do here at the observatory concerns exoplanets, which are planets outside of the solar system. These planets uh, are simply too small and too far for us to see on their own. So as you can tell by the funny graph behind me, in order to find the planets, we have to not look at the planets, but instead look at the star because assuming everything isn't face on with us, at some point or another, the planet is going to go in front of its star, block out a bit of light and then leave. Since we know that these planets and the stars, at least we hope they are, are both circles. If we have found a square planet, something's gone very wrong. Since the planet and star are both circles, they will end up making a curve as it goes in front, as it will block more and more light until it's all the way across. Would, and then it will block less and less light as it leaves. If we have an understanding of when this event will happen, we can take lots of images of the star and plot the brightness of the star over time, forming this curve-shaped graph called the light curve. We do follow up behind the TESS mission, Transiting Exoplanet Surveyor Satellite, run by NASA and MIT, as it is a bit of painstaking to 
look at every single star in the sky at once, which is the job of TESS. We only have to go behind TESS for stars it is interested in, TESS objects of interest, TOIs. We have a we have a question from Douglas. What is the field of view of the eyepiece? I bet he's doing that worksheet. The field of view of the eyepiece is 24 arc minutes. The for comparison, if you remember the full moon image. Where's my mouse? There's my mouse. Hello. Yay. The full moon image was slightly bigger. All right, I don't. You remember the full moon image was slightly bigger than the field of view of the camera. That is because the full moon is about 30 arc minutes in diameter. Therefore, we can't see the entire full moon at once. Let's respond to Douglas in text. 24 arc minutes. For Thomas Dennis, he asks, is the aperture of the telescope 32 inches? It sure is. The aperture of the telescope refers, at least for our reflecting telescope, the aperture is the primary area where incident light, incoming light hits. If you remember from my brief lesson on the anatomy of the telescope, the light first hits the primary mirror, which is 32 inches across. Therefore, the aperture of the telescope is 32 inches. Uh, some of the other telescopes we have have an eight inch aperture uh, their big mirror is eight inches across. Uh, for comparison, the Green Bank National Radio Observatory has an aperture of 300 meters or about the size of a couple football fields. It is colossal. Or no, it's, yeah, it's very big. Biggest steerable thing. No other questions at this moment? Comments, concerns, requests? Because if that is the case, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up for the night. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this has been the last evening under the stars for the semester, although we will have public hours for the next couple, Thursday and Fridays. Although I don't know about Thursday because it's uh, looking like pretty crummy weather. So definitely check us out this coming weekend or next uh, before we end up breaking for the summer. And then be sure to check us out in the fall once classes start again. Uh, I'm Ian Helm and I've been your tour guide for the evening. Thank you for coming and good night. Let's see, how do you stop recording?